This is ABC's Wide World of Sports. At Indianapolis, the rain has gone, the skies are clearing, the cars, the crews, and the fans are ready to go racing. The Indianapolis 500, a cornerstone of the American sporting landscape. Many of our great racing heroes have been defined by their accomplishments on this two and a half mile oval. The Speedway has no greater hero than A.J. Foyt. His 35 performances on the Indianapolis stage have included tantrums, tears, and four Indy wins. Danny Sullivan took the lead in the 1985 race, then rescued his spinning race car with a heroic effort that saved his car and won him the race. Since 1911, this event has grown in scope and stature, fueled by the deeds of America's greatest racers. The Unser brothers, Al and Bobby, gave the crowd steely performances that won seven races between them. Then Al Unser Jr. racked up huge hero points in this thrilling duel to the finish. Later, Little Al, with this magnificent sprint to the finish, won the closest race in Indy history. This is a dangerous sport, yet the allure of victory in Indianapolis is a powerful force. Mario Andretti was the dashing young winner of the 69 race, but his star-crossed efforts to win again made him heroic in his failure. No winning performance in Indianapolis can match the heroics of Buddy Lazier a year ago. In March, he broke his back in 38 places. In May, he returned to the cockpit to drive the 500-mile race. Eight laps from the finish, he took the lead and then went on to win the great race in storybook fashion. Today, 35 drivers pursue the quest for racing's greatest prize. It is a day for heroic performance. The risks are considerable, but the reward is the ultimate, victory in the Indianapolis 500. ABC's Wide World of Sports continues the tradition of live coverage at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's the greatest spectacle in racing, the 81st running of the Indianapolis 500. Rain yesterday postponed the 500-mile race without a lap run for the fifth time in 80 races. It's cool, but the forecast is better today. Indy is man seeking perfection in a harsh environment. There is no room for error when the speeds are above 200 miles an hour and the walls are 50 feet away. Indy is powerful cars. Indy is heroic deeds. Indy is the pinnacle of auto racing. But above all, Indy is a human story. And that human story was played out to a frenetic uncertainty yesterday. But for men like pole sitter Ari Leyendijk, today he is simply left alone with his thoughts in an empty garage area. Going to the office area, sitting down with his chiropractor, and Ari Leyendijk is now trying to get refocused. How difficult will it be, Ari? It won't be very difficult. It's pretty uh, relaxing today, a lot more than yesterday, in fact, because it just seems so much quieter out there, not that many people roaming around the garage area, so we're pretty relaxed. It still will take 800 left-hand turns and 500 miles to make it to Victory Lane. Good luck. Thank you very much. He's young, he's brash, most importantly, he's fast, and seemingly nothing bothers Tony Stewart, including a 24-hour rain delay at Indianapolis. The question is, as you start from the middle of the front row, do you aggressively go for the lead, or you take a more cautious approach? Well, I'd love to lead this thing in the first corner, but, uh, you know, if we can do it and do it easily, then we'll try to do it, but, uh, you know, we got a long race today, and, and everybody's kind of being careful with these motors, so uh, if, if we can get it easy, yes, we'll try to lead it, but if not, we just want to get through one and two safely, and then uh, let everybody string out and just go racing later. Tony Stewart and Rick Mears, the only gentlemen to start this race their first two years in the front row. Italian rookie Vincenzo Sospiri starts on the outside of row one, which means at the start, as many as 32 cars will follow him with a drop of the green. He told us earlier he has not driven in an actual race in 19 months and has never experienced a rolling start. Vincenzo, what is it in your mind you definitely have to do on the first lap? 
Well, I try to don't lose any concentration, stay up with the higher line dive, which is a pole guy, and, and they can get the best start I can. Well, the start could be a bit of a gamble for this man from Monte Carlo. Robbie Gordon, like all the other drivers at Indianapolis, sat through a rain delay yesterday. And then finally at 2.30, he bolted for Charlotte. He arrived there at 4.15 just in time for the driver's meeting, another rain delay, and the race finally got started at 6.15. And then on lap 182, he spun, hit the turn four wall, and continued on. Robbie Gordon, you were back and forth. Charlotte, Indianapolis. You stayed down there overnight. You got here early in the morning. You had leg cramps during the, during the race yesterday. How do you feel? What do you expect today? And how tired are you? I'm not very tired. Um, we got cramped up a little bit in the race last night. Um, you know, when I wrecked there, it was a little unfortunate. We knew the rain was going to come in about 20 laps and we had to go. So, um, you know, today it's a 500 mile race. Of course, we're concerned like everybody else if the motors are going to run for 500. But all the guys on the course team have done their job. We think we can do it. Mother Nature black flag this event yesterday. We're in the motorhome with Buddy Lazier, last year's winner. And Buddy, you've been a little bit under the weather also this month. Uh, the delay, is that a, a positive or a negative for you? Well, I think it's just all the same for me. I, I mean, I really feel bad for the fans. Um, what was amazing yesterday, it's pretty clear that they have a lot of passion and a lot of love for the sport because they, you know, as they were walking back and we watched them, they had smiles on their faces. So I think they're a lot like the drivers in that they, uh, they love the race and they, they understood there's just nothing any of us could do about it. Competitive drivers, competitive people can take any situation and turn it into a positive. Up on top of the paddock grandstand, there are two small booths. One is the USAC Race Control Center. The other is our broadcast position. From here, you can see for miles and the weather looks much better today. The Indy 500 is changing. That's nothing new. Indy has changed a dozen times in its history. Strong emotion is not new either. Many third and fourth generations are here in the same seats their families have occupied for years. For them, Indy is an emotional commitment. So it's little wonder in this time of change that there are strong opinions. This year, there are newly designed cars and engines. No longer are the turbochargers and their pop-off valves a problem. They're gone. This year, there are 13 new drivers from a wide variety of motor racing disciplines. This year, there are 35 starters, not the traditional 33. The IRL had reserved 25 starting spots for their cars, but two non-IRL cars set marks faster than those machines. So the IRL decided to add the two extra cars so that they would, in fact, start the fastest 33. That set off this year's controversy. But Indy is constantly changing, and arguments are commonplace. It's what draws hundreds of thousands of people to the Speedway every year. It is the summit of motor racing. Now, in a moment, you'll hear from more drivers, and we'll show you the differences in the machines. You're tuned in now to see your favorite daytime shows on ABC. They will return tomorrow. Indy, and the new Indy Racing League, is ready for the 81st running of the Indy 500. running of the Indianapolis 500 on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Brought to you by Oldsmobile and your authorized Aurora retailers. Valvoline Duraplan, the number one selling semi-synthetic motor oil. Goodyear, number one in tires. And National Car Rental. At National, green means go. We're counting down to the start of the engines. Three former winners join our broadcast team today. Three-time champion Bobby Unser, the 83 winner Tom Sneva, and the 85 winner Danny Sullivan. Later today, Tom will join me in the broadcast booth, and Danny Sullivan will be over turn four. They've all experienced a rain delay. I think we all react a little bit different to that kind of situation. For me, it was like a race car that was pushing. I didn't like it at all. 
you got ready to go at a certain time. You got all hyped up. Uh, it, it takes a lot of focus, and it took a lot of time to get there. You're here for three weeks. It's a long time, and uh, I didn't want to have to come back the next day, but I wanted to give him a 500-mile race. Well, of course, when you did come back that next day, you had a little problem when you, when you came back. But I think the big problem is you're here for that month. The buildup is for that Sunday race. Everything is leading up to that. You wake up in the morning, it's raining. What a downer. You go down flat, then all of a sudden it dries out a little bit. You think you're going to get the race. You lift back up, and then it goes raining again, and you go down, and then they finally say, okay, we're coming back tomorrow. I had a very difficult time with that. I thought it was very hard to go up and down like that all the time. Well, let's hear from another champion, Bobby Unser, who's over there in turn two. How did you deal with that, Bobby? Well, Danny and Tom, I had it rough. I remember back in the middle 70s, I came out here three different days in a row. Now, every morning, I, and I was fast that year, and every morning I woke up, I'd go to the racetrack knowing I'm going to run. The weatherman always says, the race is going to happen today, as you guys have seen this year. But, but in true, it didn't happen. So my stomach each day just kept getting tighter and tighter and tighter. I was running out of clean clothes. The game plans for the race just went totally to heck, and when the race finally did happen, I forgot what our original game plans were. Now, Led the race, went fast that day, dropped out. It was the end of a terrible year. Gordon John Cock won it. He was a happy guy. But I never wanted to do that again. Paul? Of course, in that uh, subsequent year, Tom Sneva spun on the pace lap. Now, the starting field here is made up of 12 rows determined over two weekends of time trials. Like all of us, the drivers have their moments, their memories, and their superstitions. That's our focus as we look at the starting field beginning in the last row. For only the second time since 1933, a 12th row is lined up on the grid. The lineage continues for one of America's fastest families as Johnny Unzer makes his second 500 effort. Today represents the 61st start for the Unzer family, following in the tradition set by Al, Bobby, and Al Unzer Jr. Now a seasoned veteran, Lynn St. James, prepares for her sixth consecutive 500 with her eyes closed. One of the things I do to prepare for the Indy 500 is to visualize clean, fast laps in my head. Today, she'll start the number 90 to Laura Infinity. In row 11, a sophomore at the Brickyard, Paul Durant remembers the unique sportsmanship displayed by Al Unzer Jr. when he gave the thumbs up signal to winner Emerson Fittipaldi after their epic struggle in 1989. A rookie from Canada, Claude Bourbonnet is an 11th hour entry not having a ride until a week ago, he is aware of the pressures and rituals of a 500 competitor. Gearing up for his third 500, Alessandro Zampedri led 20 laps here a year ago. He climbs in on the right side. It's his superstition on race day. Two winners have come from the 10th row, but none since 1936. Although a freshman at the Brickyard, Greg Ray is totally relaxed before it is time to get strapped into the race car. He even manages to grab a few more blissful moments of sleep before the start of the race. The first Spaniard to qualify for the greatest spectacle in racing, Fermin Velez's most memorable moment was earning a coveted spot in the field one year ago. Dennis Vitolo is making his first start since 94. He rides with a good luck charm. My son Jonathan gave me a little Wiley Coyote, and since he's been in the car, the luck's changed and things been better. Today, he'll start the number 54, Delara, powered by an Infinity. Two winners have come from the ninth row. Marco Greco is entering his third 500. The Brazilian often has Tony Robbins, a sports psychologist, at his side to help him prepare for the 500-mile run. Today, the Brazilian will start the red number 22. Tice Carlson is a short track seat of the pants racer who's one of the 13 rookies. A silent prayer before the start is part of his race morning ritual. A native of Indiana, Mark Dismore, will be in his second 500. Although he doesn't consider himself superstitious, he will be wearing a helmet with a paint scheme that carried him to many victories in the Atlantics and the 24 hours of Daytona. Three rookies fill the same role for the first time since 1985. A rookie from Arizona, Billy Rowe, was asked to serve on Tom Sneva's pit crew in 83. A prior commitment forced him to pass up the invitation. Now he's back at the Brickyard to savor a dream of a lifetime in number 50. A graduate of the U.S. Formula Ford Series, rookie Sam Schmidt has had a memorable and adventurous month. 
And we've been on an emotional roller coaster, but uh, the whole month has been something that I'll remember for the rest of my life. His number 16 is a Delara powered by an Aurora. A genuine terror of the Western Midget Series, freshman Billy Boat has idled A.J. Foyt since he was five years old. Today, he'll drive A.J.'s car in the Indy 500. Well, just being here today is evidence of an amazing and astounding comeback for Alessandro Zampedri. A year ago, you may recall the last lap, final turn, the red car, airborne, horrendous crash into the fence. Now, following nine surgeries, countless hours of rehab, he's back, ready for his second Indy 500. How close to 100% do you feel going into this race? Well, racing-wise, I would say I'm 99.9. Uh, .9. I feel great. Uh, I feel very strong. I train a lot and work very hard. And uh, honestly, I feel, you know, with a lot of energy and... Uh, I feel I can go all the 500 miles. Uh, my major car has been running strong uh, lately, so I really look forward for a nice, strong run today. He starts in the 11th row, of course, and uh, trying to get revenge for what fate dealt a cruel hand last year. Jack? Gary, if you're a rookie, you have a lot of uncertainties leading into the Indy 500. That's the case for Billy Rowe. So his car owner, Antonio Ferrari, has prepared a book telling him what to expect, what to see on the pit boards. And Billy, you say that the rain actually helped you as a rookie. Yeah, I think we got to go through the scenario of the morning of the race. Now we get to do it the second time, and I think we're more prepared this time than we were yesterday. Yeah, and Jack, I got this announcer's handbook here for you because I noticed you've been having trouble with your announcing, and uh, I'd like you to read it. Since I'm in the textbook business, and I sell textbooks, but I'll give it to you for free. Jerry? Well, 29-year-old rookie Sam Smith's racing career started at age 5 in motocross and abruptly stopped at age 10 when his father was paralyzed in an off-road racing accident. His mother's dream was for him to get an education. He now has a master's in international finance. His father's dream was to someday run the Indy 500. Today, Sam fulfills both his and his father's dream. Sam, this must be special for you. Uh, it's extremely special. You know, this has been a lifetime family dream, and uh, it doesn't really matter where we're starting or where we finish. We're here, and uh, we hope to be here for a lot of years to come. Irrespective of where he finishes, his parents have to be proud. Paul? Sam Schmidt, one of the great stories here. Out on the main straightaway, the cars already sit in position. In the field today, there are two new chassis types and two engine manufacturers. Today, hovering above the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the Goodyear Blimp Spirit. This is the Goodyear Blimp that is based over in Akron, Ohio. She's so beautiful up in skies that are much more clear today. Now, we've told you about the changes in the rules. It's an astonishing feat that two new cars and engines were developed in one year and are ready to race today. Gary and Jack can get us up to date on the new designs. There are only two chassis available to drivers in this year's Indy 500. You have the Delara chassis here, made in Italy. There are 21 of them in the 35 car field. And you have the G-Force chassis, 14 of these made in England competing in today's race. There's one key way that you can tell the difference between a Delara and a G-Force on television. On the G-Force, notice in front of the rear wheels, it's clean coming off the side pod right here. By contrast, when you go over to the Delara, you'll see this aerodynamic flip-up or kick-up wing right here in front of the rear tire. These cars generate about 15% less downforce than a year ago, and they've been slowed by 15 to 20 miles per hour. The biggest difference you'll see between last year's car and this year's car is this air induction box right behind the driver's head. And Gary, the reason we need this air induction box is there's a brand new engine formula as well. This year, they use a normally aspirated, non-turbocharged, four-liter power plant that needs that air. Now, teams, again, can choose between two engines. One is the Oldsmobile Aurora, the other is the Nissan Infiniti. Oldsmobile accounts for 29 in the 35-car starting field, and Infiniti has six. Now, these are production-based engines. What that means is you could find a similar engine underneath the hood of your passenger car, but they are purpose-built. They've been severely modified to withstand the rigors of 500 miles of racing. Now, the differences between the Oldsmobile, well, the Oldsmobile's a little shorter, a little lighter, puts out just a little bit more horsepower. The folks at Infinity have concentrated on reliability and feel that that is going to be the ticket to making it to Victory Lane. We continue to look at the starting field, the middle of the field, where there are six veterans, five rookies, and one sophomore. The seventh row has produced five Indianapolis 500 winners. 
stepping up from Indy Lights, Robbie Groff is in his first Indy 500. His most memorable moment at the Brickyard was when his older brother Mike qualified for the 1991 race. Today, he'll drive the number 30. It's a G-Force powered by Aurora. 14-time World of Outlaws Sprint Car Champion Steve Kinzer is making his first 500 start. He has a soft spot in his heart for the classic Roadster era in the 40s and 50s, Indy's most romantic years. Starting his 13th Indy 500, Roberto Guerrero has twice finished second, but his most sparkling memory remains his stunning full run with a one and four lap record. He set it in 1992. The record stood for four years. In the sixth row, veteran Mike Groff, who is anxiously awaiting his fourth start at the Indy 500. His most vivid memory was Mario Andretti's popular triumph in the 1969 500-mile race. The IRL points leader will be starting number 10. The racing dentist from nearby Carmel, Indiana, rookie Jack Miller, has been one of the most promotionally-minded and fan-friendly rookies to come to the famed Brickyard in many a year. Colorado native Buzz Calkins is starting his second 500. He first attended when he was 16 years old. He stood just outside the gasoline alley sign back then. Today, he'll walk under it with his racing gear in hand. Seven times the 500 winner has started in the fifth row. A native of Sweden, Kenny Brack is another of the talented rookies in today's field. His first hot lap here at Indy will forever be etched in his memory. He drives for Rick Gallus, who won the race as an owner in 92. A quiet and unassuming rookie, Alfonso Giafoni, joined the field on the first day of time trial. He's proud to follow his fellow Brazilian, Emerson Fittipaldi, to the hallowed halls of the Brickyard. Stefan Gregoire will run his third Indy 500 today. His biggest thrill in his career was qualifying for the 93 500 as a 24-year-old rookie. He qualified faster than Fittipaldi, who won the race that year. Only three 500 winners have started in row four. Flamboyant Robbie Gordon is gearing up for his fourth start. Twice, he's led the great race. One of my most memorable moments was in 1995 to come from a lap down and end up leading the race. And to finish the Indy 500 is always a success. Today, Robbie Gordon will start number 42. In his eighth race, Eddie Cheever acknowledges the compelling ingredients of the 500. He respects A.J. Foyt above all other drivers for his four wins and 35 straight starts on the Memorial Day weekend classic. Buddy Lazier is the defending champion of the Indianapolis 500. Last year, he authored a spine-tingling charge from third to first in the waning laps and then took a sip of milk in victory lane, a tradition that began 60 years ago. Well, a man who's a big fan of Indianapolis, the festivities, getting ready for his eighth 500, Eddie Cheever. How do you assess your chances to win this thing today, Eddie? I tried to do it seven other times, and now I'm changing strategy, but I can't tell you what it is, but I think uh, we're in good shape for today. This is the Indianapolis 500. If you're a racing driver, this is where you want to be. The only thing is, it's the 26th of May, not the 25th. There you have it. We'll watch Eddie Cheever with great interest, car 51. Paul? Well, the clock continues to count until the engines start. It's now just 24 minutes for that command. For the ninth time, that command will include the word lady. The front of the field is where the fastest qualifiers from pole day reside. 58 winners have come from the first three rows. They are the top contenders. Seven winners have come from the third row. Starting ninth, Eliseo Salazar has finished no worse than sixth in his two previous Indy 500 appearances. His most memorable moment was finishing a strong fourth in his rookie effort in 1995. Starting eight is sophomore Davey Hamilton, who has enjoyed a quiet and uneventful month of May at Indy. He drives for A.J. Foyt in a G-Force powered by Aurora. A graduate of the tough Super Modified Series, Hamilton's finest moment was qualifying for the race a year ago. A native of Scotland, rookie Jeff Ward came from a background in motorcycle racing, five times a motocross champion, twice a supercross champion. Ward has always admired the four-time Indy 500 winner, Rick Mears. The 500 has been won 17 times in the second row. Racing from Albuquerque, New Mexico, Jim Guthrie in his second race is accustomed to taking risks. 
He and his wife hocked everything for a chance to race in the IRL. He was rewarded with a win at Phoenix, but he was still in debt to the tune of $85,000. Canadian Scott Goodyear is competing in his seventh 500 mile race. In 1992, he charged from the last starting position to finish a close second to Al Unser Jr. in what was the closest finish in the 80 runnings of the Indy 500. Robbie Buell is driving his second 500. He first came to the Speedway in 71 as an upper deck spectator. My most memorable moment of the 500 is when I first fell in love with racing. It was when I was age seven and I came here. 34 winners have come from the front row, including five in the last nine. Italian Vincenzo Sospiri, the fastest rookie in the field. His great memory is simply arriving at the Indy 500. Well, when I went under the tunnel, I, I felt a very cold chill on my back, and I said to myself, uh, here I am to do the Indy 500 in America. Sophomore sensation Tony Stewart is a racer's racer. He'll drive anything. In 94, he took the USAC Midget Championship. In 1995, it was the hat trick with the Midget, Sprint, and Silver Crown title. Yeah. Ari Leyendijk is on the pole for the second time at the Indy 500. He owns many of the speed records at this grand racing palace. The one and four lap qualifying record. The fastest speed ever in practice at nearly 240 miles an hour. In 90, he drove the fastest 500 ever at 185.9 miles an hour, starting outside the front row. Only 15 times has the pole sitter won the race. Scott Goodyear has been suffering from a very serious case of the strep throat. Scott, how does this one day affect your illness? Well, we're definitely a lot better today than we were yesterday, and uh, every day seems to be a bit of an advantage, so I'm just glad we didn't race a week from uh, where we are now because last week was pretty brutal, but uh, we're doing real well, and I don't even think about it right now. I'm so focused on what's going to happen out there. Paul, a race car can be a great remedy to an illness. Of the 35 starting today, only two, Ari Leyendijk and Buddy Lazier, have visited Victory Lane. When we come back, you'll meet this year's success story, the Phoenix winner, Jim Guthrie. This is the 81st Indy 500, live on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Inside the second row is a former Indy Lights champion with possibly the best chance he's ever had driving here for John Monard. Gary? No question, Robbie Buell probably has more test miles this year in this track than any other driver. Have you ever been better prepared for a race than you are today? No, we're prepared. I mean, there's a lot of depth at Team Menard. We've done a lot of miles here. We feel pretty confident, but uh, you always need a little bit of luck, and uh, we'll just kind of have our race today and see where we end up. And the command has gone out to get into the car. Have a great day. Thank you. Paul? In this, the IRL, there are many stories of unknowns who have made good. One of the nicest stories in the Indy Racing League is that of Albuquerque, New Mexico's Jim Guthrie. It is a tale of commitment. Here's Jack Aroot. This is a story about two young lovers, the story of New Mexico's Jim and Missy Guthrie. Met Jim when I was 15, and I, I fell in love with him the minute I saw him. Theirs was the American dream, a home, two children, a small business, and Jim's hobby, motor racing. But the dream turned into a nightmare when Missy discovered she had cancer. When they told me you could have knocked me over with a feather, I mean, it was, it was devastating. Missy's chemotherapy and mastectomy followed, and Jim Guthrie walked away from racing. That's when I knew that he loved me. It wasn't um, anything that we had gone through. It wasn't because I was there. I stuck through the thick and thin of building a business. He really, truly loved me. Cured of her cancer, Missy told her lover that it was her turn to support him. She told Jim to embrace his dream, a professional driving career. When you love someone as much as I love Jim, it doesn't matter. I mean, I have so much faith and so much confidence in him. He's not going to, he's not going to put us through something that he cannot get us out of. They mortgaged all of their possessions and joined the IRL, but finances threatened the dream. I had told Jim, you know, if we don't do well at Phoenix, we can't get to Andy. There's just no, I mean, we're tapped out. I don't know where else we're going to get any more money. And I said, um, you know, you've got to finish at least in the top five. 
for us to be able to continue on. Jim Guthrie may do the impossible. In fact, he has. That Phoenix 200 win rescued their budget and brought the Guthries to Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Triumphant over cancer and winners in racing, they embrace and still honor that inexplicable lure that first brought them together as teenagers. When you lay your head down next to his at night, what do you think? How lucky I am um, to have a man who stands by me and supports me. Um, sorry. I'm just very fortunate. Jim Guthrie, you returned to Indianapolis, a definite candidate for the win. How is it different than last year? Uh, last year, we were just part of the race. This year, we could be the race. So we're going to do our best to uh, wind up in victory lane. Paul? Well, they've called the drivers now to strap into their cars. The moment is quickly approaching when we come back. The formal and the very traditional ceremonies on the Indy straightaway will begin. Many of the fans, also the Purdue All-American Band, the flyover, many of these things could not return to Indianapolis for the formal ceremonies for today. But nevertheless, they are ready to begin with just slight alterations. We join the public address system. Returning to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, again the ever-lovely Florence Henderson. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and salute this great nation as Florence Henderson presents our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Capella and the crowd loved it. Now we're moving closer to the start of the engines. We'll return with more of the Indianapolis 500 after this message and a word from our ABC station. The 81st running of the Indianapolis 500 continues on ABC's Wide World of Sports. This is Memorial Day when we remember and honor those who have given the ultimate sacrifice to keep America the land of liberty. Each year here at the Speedway, we remember with the rendering of taps. We ask you to remain standing. On this Memorial Weekend, we pause here in a moment of silence to pay homage to those individuals who have given their lives unselfishly and unafraid to make it possible for us to witness as free men and women the world's greatest sporting event. We also pay homage to those men and women who have given their lives unselfishly and without fear to make racing the world's most spectacular spectator sport.
For race fans, regretfully, our friend Jim Neighbors is unable to be with us in person. However, Jim hopes you will enjoy his recorded presentation of a Speedway tradition. Jim Neighbors and back home again in Indiana. traditional release of the multicolored balloons from the area behind the control tower. Thank you very much, Jim Neighbor. gentlemen we are just a few moments away now from hearing those famous words certainly an emotional time for all of us as we wait the start of the 81st running of this event and the time has arrived and here to give those famous words is chairman of the board of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Mrs. Mary Hellman George Start your engines. And that brisk command sends the team.
crews give the thumbs up sign as they motor past. Now let's take a look at the starting field for the 81st running of the Indy 500. On the pole, Ari Leyendijk, his 13th Indy 500, and fourth time on the front row, Tony Stewart. The second straight front row start at Indy. And Vincenzo Sospori, the fastest rookie in the field, who has not taken a flying start in big cars. In the second row, Robbie Buell, he ran ninth in last year's 500. Scott Goodyear, who ran second here in 92. And Jim Guthrie, the popular winner at Phoenix. Row three, Jeff Ward, the rookie from Scotland. Davey Hamilton, the sophomore in A.J. Boyd's car. And LSAO Salazar, the veteran from Chile. The fourth row, Buddy Lazier, the defending champion here. Eddie Cheever, his eighth 500. And Robbie Gordon, who has twice finished in fifth place. In row five, Stefan Gregoire, the youngster from France, his third Indy 500. Afonso Giafoni, a 29-year-old freshman from Brazil. And Kenny Breck, a graduate from the Formula 3000 series. Row six, Buzz Calkins, a 26-year-old Colorado native. Dr. Jack Miller, the racing dentist from nearby Carmel, Indiana. And Mike Groff, the IRL point leader. In row seven, Roberto Guerrero, twice a runner-up in the 500. Steve Kinzer, the king of the outlaws. Robbie Groff, he's made the jump over from Indy Lights. In row eight, Billy Boat registered the sixth fastest speed overall. Sam Smith from Las Vegas and Billy Rowe. The ninth row, Mark Dismore, Tice Carlson taking over for the injured John Paul Jr. and Brazilian Marco Greco. The tenth row, Dennis Vitolo, Fermin Velez of Spain and Greg Ray, a Texas rookie who has been quietly quick. The 11th row, Alessandro Zampedri, who was bumped but then got back in with a late qualifying run. Claude Bourbonnet, Jim Guthrie's teammate, and Paul Durant. In the 12th row, added Lynn St. James, her sixth straight 500-mile start, and Johnny Unser, the fifth Unser to start the 500-mile race. On board the pace car, there's three-time champion Johnny Rutherford. He will bring the field to the green. Looking out the back of that pace car, the view of the field. They've not yet assembled into the rows of three. Let's go to Jackaroo. Paul, you talk about that new sound, but there's new things that the crew has to deal with. Remember, on board, in lieu of the normal 40-gallon fuel cell in the past, it's 35 gallons. Methanol is still the fuel of choice, but here's what you must consider. With less on board, that means more pit stops. Now, granted, most teams are making about two miles to the gallon, but some teams have said as many as seven, eight stops, but if there's a lot of caution, a couple of teams may try to make it in six. Gary? And with those seven or eight stops, Jack, there are many teams here at Indianapolis who have very little experience in 500-mile races, and particularly at Indy. It's a huge challenge for all of these individuals. If any of this equipment should happen to fail, or if an individual has a problem, it could be devastating to their driver. Remember, you lose one or two seconds here on pit road, it costs you hundreds of yards on the racetrack. They know that they've got the biggest challenge they've ever faced, but they've got to wait before they can spring into action for the first time. It'll be 25 laps or so before we see them go to work, and then they've got to deliver the performance of a lifetime. Jerry? Well, Gary, the index of error could escalate today when you add in one more factor along with inexperience, and that is fatigue. For the past two days, these crews have gotten 3 o'clock in the morning wake-up calls, have had to come to the track by 4.30 in the morning. Yesterday, with the rain delay, they were here late last night, wiping off parts, trying to get them dry. The crews are tired. When you're fatigued, you lose focus. When you lose focus and can't concentrate, that can lead to miscues in the pits. Of course, Paul, that could be a big problem with at least seven pit stops here today. It's not just the drivers today with so much on the line for every manufacturer. We'll track the combinations of chassis, the engines, and the tires in today's race. Now, here are the top stories of the day and the ones we're going to keep track of for you. There is, of course, the situation with 13 rookies in the field. A lot of inexperience there. The weather is cool here, and it has been very windy. There'll be more pit stops this year, seven to nine and they'll come approximately every 23 laps and of course the attrition the engines are very definitely a concern here today let's go with one lap to go as they begin the pace lap and check in above turn four danny sullivan well of course you can hear these loud engines going back and that's been one of the focuses all month the reliability nobody's had any luck with that when that green flag falls it's not going to matter either they're going to go 500 miles 
or they're not. Over to Bobby. Yeah, I just think right now the drivers, Danny, are not looking at the crowd anymore. They're concentrating. Some of them better be aware that the tires are cold, the track is cold. Some of these tires don't work good on the cold track. There's an awful lot of inexperience. Now let's go down to Tom. Well, anticipating the track conditions at the start of the race is very difficult. In fact, many times it's going to become a lucky guess. The more experienced teams usually are going to have a more educated guess. Now, they're all going to be fishing for that setup, but as the race develops, the teams will have probably six or seven opportunities to adjust that setup, change the car to try to match those track conditions. Ari Leyendijk is the pole sitter, Tony Stewart the middle of the row, Vincenzo Sospiri in that blue and white car lagging back just a bit as Johnny Rutherford now brings the field through the third turn, heading across the north chute at the north end of the speedway. The field begins to form up now into the 11 rows of three. They're looking for 100 yards in between the different rows. One car headed for the pit area, the pace car, now comes off of the racetracks. The field aligns. They'll bring him down very close. We've got a car into the wall, several of them. Right on the start, Kenny Breck. The 17 car of Alfonso Giafoni into the wall. And that's before the start. They're down just uh, just on the outside of the entrance to turn four, Paul. That's long before they even get near the starting line. So the field, obviously, they displayed yellow at the start-finish line. And this is exactly what we were most concerned with. Stefan Gregoire, Alfonso Tiafoni, and Kenny Breck are those identified as involved. Paul, a lot of these problems are probably coming from the cold tires. Remember, some of these tires don't work good on cold pavement, and I'll bet they were trying to get the tires warmed up, and that's what causes it. Well, you remember we have had that problem in the past here. Remember that very, very cool year, Tom Sneva, when uh, the tires just would not heat on the restarts? Well, we had a lot of problem back there that year. I mean, there was two or three accidents on the pace lap, and, and a lot of them throughout the race. Looks like the, uh, the whole fifth row is out as a result of uh, the incident coming off of turn four. The safety equipment is there, and the start of the Indy 500 has now been marred with an accident even before the green flag came out. The three drivers involved discuss it standing on the track. We'll be back. in Indianapolis the race has not yet started an incident just before the start has taken out the entire fifth row this is on board with Steve Kinzer Tom Sneva well I don't know if we're going to be able to see anything here well oh it looks like well the two cars got together turned Breck sideways I still can't tell who ran into Breck though we were looking at uh, at a video earlier that uh, doesn't give you very much information but does show that it appears that Kenny Breck was hit from behind. Marco Greco comes into the pits and Dennis Vitolo's already in. Jerry Punch? Well, totally unrelated to what happened on the racetrack, Paul, but a big break for Dennis Vitolo. Apparently a problem with the throttle linkage on the left side of the engine. That is Greg Beck, who owns the car, is on the far right side trying to get that repaired, but certainly somewhat of a break for Vitolo to get this fixed under the caution and get the car back out in the early laps. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Mark Stainbrook was on the radio with the spotters for Afonso Giafoni, and you also heard from their driver. What did he tell you, Mark? Well, he said a lot of bad words, but apparently Kenny Brack, starting on the outside of him, didn't leave room and pulled down into the groove and, and ran into him and knocked him into uh, Gregoire and took the whole row out. It's unfortunate. I mean, you know, somebody should have coached Brack a little better on the start, I guess. All right, Jack. Well, Gary, as this was all unfolding in the fifth row, the front row got on the radio, namely Ari Leyendijk, and said, what happened? Now, here's what's happened. They relayed to him what, what transpired behind him, but they're very concerned because, remember, I alluded to the fact that maybe we would see six stops instead of seven. At initial thought, they thought, hey, we can go back on the fuel, be able to conserve fuel. Then they realize that the race has not started. So even though they're not burning a lot of fuel, this will change the fuel windows and dramatically affect the tactics for the rest of this race. 
Robbie Groff appears to have a problem. We have no idea what's gone wrong here. He just sits in the middle of the backstretch. Emergency crews going to him. This is all before the green flag wave. We've not started the 500. It's the sixth time in 500 history that an incident has occurred before the start. Well, a little bit of what happens on these starts is when they're three abreast, you're actually running in a lot different place in the racetrack than you normally do, do during the race. It's a groove that you're not normally in, and probably Breck on the outside of that row was thought he was high in the groove, but actually was, there's not enough room for all three cars, and you've got to run in virgin territory when you're on these pace laps. So one of the rookies, Robbie Groff, already with a problem, and they haven't even started the fifth row. They have major problems. They will not start. That's an incident before the green flag at Indianapolis. We'll be back. The 81st running of the Indianapolis 500 on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Brought to you by Valvoline Duraplan, the number one selling semi-synthetic motor oil. Oldsmobile and your authorized Aurora retailers. Goodyear, number one in tires. And priority mail from the U.S. Postal Service. Back at Indianapolis, the field does not get started. Continues to circle behind the pace car. A lot going on. Sam Schmidt appears to have an engine problem. Jerry Punch? Oh, we're here in Robbie Gross pit. Dennis McCormick, who is the car owner, is watching and waiting for his driver down pit road they're trying to get him towed in and Dennis if we could ask you right quick what happened to Robbie he was just going down the back straight away he said he was in third gear and the motor just quit on him so we're trying to get him towed in here to get the electronics changed all right they're going to try to get him refired and possibly get him back on the racetrack let's go to Jackaroo well, we're waiting to see Jerry if Sam Schmidt is going to come on to pit road they were in radio communication and the crew is not sure as he comes down pit road what the smoking problem is now remember these engines have experienced oiling problems in the past this team specifically has been building and rebuilding just three or four engines you can see the smoke out there saying kill the engine this is serious and it could be terminal for sam schmidt gary another stop on pit road paul durant was in briefly just a matter of topping off on fuel as we wait the official start of this race i think everything else appears to be routine paul and all of that action before the green flag flies. Well, a lot of the cars are coming in and topping off the fuel. There was some concern whether they'd be able to go back and start in their original positions, but uh, many of them are coming in topping off. It's going to be interesting to see what the others do before green flag comes. Of course, the engines are doing that, Tom, is so they can widen out their pit strategy deal. They can get more laps and hope for a yellow flag pit under yellow as opposed to a green. So the field will now reform on the next lap. They will, of course, be minus the fifth row. They will also be minus the car of Sam Schmidt. And we'll see who else. The pits are now closed. They did open them for a while. And uh, many people, including Buddy Lazier, came through the pits. Now we've got this situation where we're going to reset the entire start. They were up yesterday, Tom Sneva. They were up for a start today. Disaster hits in turn four. Now how are they? Well, I mean, their emotions have got to be up and down. But uh, a lot of the guys have tried to practice the start, maybe even played with traffic. But, you know, there's no way you can simulate what they're about to experience uh, in the next few laps. Now, you might, in fact, after all what we've seen already, uh, you might want to move the women and children back a little bit from the TV screen. There in the starter's stand, that's General Ronald R. Fogelman, chief of staff of the Air Force. He's the honorary starter today as they celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Air Force. The field on the front stretch, they will go back into rows of three alignment. Bobby, as they come off of turn one and head for you, what are you thinking? Well, Paul, I, I just had to notice when they were coming down for the original start of how big a gap there was between the cars. Some of them were being overcautious. They just have realized over history that you must get the race started. But over here, I think they're going to be caught this time. Moving off of two, down the back stretch. Danny Sullivan, you watched that happen. You've been there any number of times. Psychology at this point. Well, of course, everybody was a little flat. Now they got pumped up for the race, and we have another little flat spot with that yellow. Now they're pumping themselves back up, but I think everybody's going to be very cautious because they've seen the mistakes that a couple other drivers have made. 
Once again, as they begin to align, Vincenzo Sospori, the, the blue and white car, scheduled to start on the outside of the front row, has dropped back in behind Tony Stewart. He did that as they approached the line the last time. Apparently, he is uh, very respectful of the start of this race and doesn't look like he wants any part of the drag race that Ari Leontyke and Tony Stewart are about to stage. Rumor says Barry has never started a rolling start in big cars. Again, the pace car is off. The field now comes down toward the green flag. They are closely bunched. And here we go. The green flag finally out in Indianapolis. Ari Leontyke jumps into the lead. to challenge on Robbie Buell, that yellow and green car. In the pits, Alessandro Alex Zampedri. A tremendous story of courage from last year made it back in, and already his day is in trouble. Here goes Gordon. The 42 car, Robbie Gordon, comes around Sosperi and moves now, heading for Buell. He goes way wide off the corner, though. Bobby? Yes, we have to keep in mind of Robbie Gordon. A lot of experience here compared to a lot of guys in the field. So we expected Robbie to move up pretty quick. Tony Stewart leads it. Lion Dyke is second. Robbie Buell. And then that car. The gray and white Coors machine. It belongs to Robbie Gordon. He raced last night at Charlotte. Flew back this morning. He is here today, ready to try and win the Indy 500. Well, last night at Charlotte, he had to go up and through the pack two or three different times. He was real fast down there, had troubles in the pits, but uh, passed a lot of cars in that race. So as they come across the line, up at the top, we'll have our banner throughout the day. It tells you who is leading and the position of every car in the race, the lap count, and the position of those cars relative to the leader. The leader, of course, is Tony Stewart, followed by Lion Dyke, Buell, Gordon, and then Jim Guthrie, the Phoenix winner, is tucked in right behind Gordon. They're going to go into the corner side by side, but then Jim Guthrie thinks better of it. Well, one of the things I'm seeing down there in four is that uh, Robbie Gordon and Tony Stewart both seem to be able to run a little higher line than everybody else. Danny, they've been running that way over in turn two, but Tony Stewart's been doing that for some reason. He seems to like the high line here. All right, we can go back while we watch the run here at the front and review the pre-start of the race, really, Gary Gerald. Kenny Breck is back in his garage area. Kenny, can you tell us what happened as you anticipated your first Indy 500 green flag? No, I cannot really uh, tell you what, exactly what happened. All I know is that I got hit from behind, and uh, for the reason for that was is I don't know yet. I will have to wait and look at the videotape and see where all the cars were positioned and uh, what happened, you know. How concerned were you about a rolling start in this race? No, that's normal for these races. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's yeah, perfect. I, I'm extremely disappointed for uh, for uh, the team and everything and all the sponsors. We worked tremendously hard for this and uh, we didn't uh, we didn't get to do the race, you know. And uh, that's that's extremely disappointing. But anxiously looking ahead to seeing a replay himself, Paul. Ari Leontyke closing now on Tony Stewart. Battle for the lead at Indy. 
Yeah, Tony jumped right out after the uh, first couple corners, but now it looks like uh, Ari's been able to adjust his car and actually is running just a little bit faster. So let's see if he can get the pass down. Danny Sullivan, he's reeling him in. Well, he is. Don't forget, I think Tony Stewart really wanted to lead that first lap. Ari's pretty cagey. He only wants to lead that last lap. I had a talk with uh, Ryan Dyke the other night while we were downtown, and he has no interest on leading the early laps here, according to what he told me. He wants to win the race. He realizes the reliability isn't what it should be. All through the garage area, the talk here has been he who drives a very careful race is also going to end up with a victory. Jim Guthrie is pulled off of the fight and heading for the pit area. So Jim Guthrie, who was in there early, and look at the back of the engine, Danny. Yeah, we're also getting a little spray up here. We're above the grandstands in turn four, and it's raining. Jack? Jack Danny, Root? Danny, we're watching Jim Guthrie as they're putting on fuel. There is a lot of radiator overflow, so it's fairly obvious that for this team, the car is severely overheated. It is just pouring out, if you look at the back side, that is water pouring out the back side of the car that's the radiator overflow that is not a good sign i mean it's probably leaking compression into the water system that's what blows it out like that so he's definitely got engine problems so if that story is going to play Here's the today concern. hey fellas we got to change this very concerned this is out of the fuel pump the fuel overflow you can smell it down here this is a time bomb waiting to go off this engine is still running one of the fire crew from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway has taken a barrel and is trying to catch the overflow. This is something new when you're dealing with these new engines. Tom, why wouldn't they shut the engine off and stop the pump? Well, I don't know. If, if they think that's fuel, they need to get the motor down. So, we're going to track that. We're going to track the front of the field. A lot going on here at the Indianapolis 500. Stefan Gregoire was one of those involved in that pre-race accident. Gary's with him. Fon, you were inside in row five. What happened as you anticipated green? That's what I would like to know, you know. Somebody touched me on the back. I think it's Alfonso Giaffone had to touch me, and uh, apparently it's coming from Kenny. Kenny went too low on the track, and probably Alfonso didn't have room enough to stay on the middle. So somebody touched me, and uh, as soon as I, I felt something, my car went straight to the wall. Did the drivers, did you talk to each other back at the hospital? Or was anyone angry? Everybody is angry, but nobody knows what happened. Uh, everybody is thinking that they didn't do any mistake. So I would like to, to see the replay because I was very surprised. Anyway, someone touched me and uh, I had to go to the wall, you know. It's a big shame. Thank you, Stefan. Jerry? Well, Gary Sam Smith missed the accident, but it's still a short day. What happened? Well, some in the motor, we don't know specifically what, uh, you know, it just uh, results of the guys working so hard the last week trying to put a bunch of motors together, and, and uh, it's blowing water out the left bank, so we're not sure what it is, but it's not going to go very far. All right, Sam Smith out of yep. it. Let's go to Paul. Yellows come out, Claude Bourbonnet. That's a teammate to Jim Guthrie, the car that was in the pits pumping what was reported as fuel. And now here is Claude Bourbonnet, the 72 car, as he pulls over smoke at the back end. Tom, looks like a motor. Yeah, it, it does. And this is a team that won at Phoenix and had great engine reliability. Now all three of their cars are out in the first part of the race. So an entire team gone. And, of course, that story while we watch Claude Bourbonnet, the, the leader of this team, Jim Guthrie, who had such a grand day at Phoenix and had so much riding on this race, now all three cars, which have been very powerful, appear to be out. Paul, well, let's update you on that situation with Jim Guthrie, the lead driver. Thankfully, it was not fuel, Tom. That's why they didn't shut it off. They panicked a little bit, but what happened is it is a radiator. It is clogged up. They're trying to work down by the side pod, but it's basically... The day is done for Jim Guthrie. So Steve Kinzer, uh, we watch from his position. He started 20th. He's now to 12th in the early going of the 500-mile race. So we are under yellow, probably for the Bourbonnet blowing engine, but there is also, as you can see on the onboard camera in there, a little bit of rain beginning to show as well. Now on May 31st, join ABC for the third round coverage of the memorial sponsored by Dean Witter. This 
we'll see this year's champion Tom Watson defend his title against the Byron Nelson winner Tiger Woods. The field with the emergency crews on there is Jim Guthrie's wife Missy. Concerned of course that Jim, Orbanay and Schmidt the entire team might be in jeopardy. Financial is in. Gary Gerald. We watched from over the wall with the team. They're waiting also for his teammate Jeff Ward. They're going to try to stagger the stops. Eddie Cheever with his first stop successfully completed. More and more raindrops. Jack, let's show you. This is a piece that goes inside the side pod between the radiator and the front of the side pod. It's called a baffle. This baffle came loose on Jim Guthrie's car, restricted the airflow into the radiators, overheated the engine. And guys, it looks like it's terminal for Guthrie. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Jerry? Back, back in the garage is Afonso Giafoni, one of the third, three drivers involved in the first lap incident. Afonso, what happened? Uh, I really know I'd like to first to see the tape first to, to get a conclusion. But what I think it happened was that we st were starting the three by three formation to start the race and then coming to corner four. I just went out of space. They, both Stefan and, and, and Kenny, they squeeze, they squeeze me and then touch wheels with them and we crash out. But I don't know if Stefan went high or Kenny went low on the track. But we were supposed to be like three by three at that, at that the race. We didn't, it didn't even like it wasn't even it wasn't even the first lap. It was like the parade lap. A little bit from Paul. But now let's just make sure we understand the Jim Guthrie story, Jack. Uh, he is obviously has a serious problem, but we talked about fuel. Yeah, let's update that, Paul. Here's what the concern was. With these new engines and the exhaust pouring out the way they were, at first look, they thought it was overheating. Then they went to the back and saw the way it was pouring back out, and they just couldn't believe that the motor had overheated like that. They began to be concerned that maybe there was a serious fuel leak. That was when the fire department sprang into action, went to the back. It became fairly evident just moments later, because it was hot coming out, that it was water. They breathed a sigh of relief and then went to work, discovered the baffle, and now, believe it or not, they're going to send Jim Guthrie back out under caution here for the rain. I don't think they're going to send him out with that spray out of the back end of Jim Guthrie's number 27 car. And by the way, he may not have to wait long. He's not losing so much time in the pits because the yellow is out, has been out since Claude Bourbonnet's engine let go. But the raincoats have come out. Some of the umbrellas have gone up. It's begun to rain at Indianapolis Paul, as it played this yesterday. Jack? Paul, as you watch this scenario, the crew going to work, they still do not realize, as we watch Missy Guthrie, that the water is still pouring out the back. They're so busy trying to reassemble the car, they haven't looked beyond the rear wing. You can see the crew working with the cowling. They run around, they still haven't looked down. This is going to be a major disappointment. Finally, a crew member notices it and is radioing to the rest of them. On the line there with the uh, two-way radio, he's talking to Jim Guthrie as he sits in the cockpit. I'm assuming trying to tell him exactly what's happening because he cannot see that well behind him. And by the way, kudos, he shuts it off. He tries to go forward, but he shuts it off. I was about to say kudos to that safety crewman who is standing right there trying to keep track of everything. Poor Missy. trouble on that engine because the compression is leaking in the water system and pushing the water out in the back and it's going to be terminal. I don't think that, that engine's going to stay much longer. Bobby, he's coming right by you. Take a real good look at it. Do you see anything? Until, uh, nothing at the back well, at wait this just, moment. Wait just a minute, Paul, when he goes by, I'll look and see if I can see water coming out. I don't see any water coming out right now, but it could be. Right, of course. We're seventh position in front of you. There might not be anything coming out the back at this point because uh, he might have already leaked the because water it, out of the Because it's all gone, Tom. I know. 19, 19, <laughs> well, the other thing, Tom, too, is if you keep running and it rains. I'm sorry, six position, Eddie. We're, of course, listening to two-way radio communications, uh, as is our style. We'll continue to do that. 
You know, these things only hold, these engines only hold about five gallons of water total between the radiator and the engine, Paul. And we watched him get an awful lot of water going to that bucket. They weren't putting any more water in the radiator, so we have to assume he doesn't have any more. All right, let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, Canadian Clothes Bourbon, we documented the fact that you had an engine problem. Uh, oh, did you have any warning at, at all that you were going to have a motor problem? Um, not really. Uh, the only thing, the engine, I could tell, was not uh, pulling properly, but there was no sign of major problem, and it just just happened right in the middle of the corner for him. Just glad the oil didn't go in the tires. Well, Schmidt, Bourbonnet, and now we hear your teammate Guthrie's having a problem. Could be a bad day for Blueprint. Uh, these, these guys have worked hard. The, the cars have been very reliable, and all of a sudden, right where you uh, you need you need everything to, to last, it, uh, there's a bit of a, there's a problem. Paul? 13 laps are now complete at the Indianapolis 500, the last several under yellow. Jim Guthrie continues to motor around. You can see the sprinkle of rain on the front of the onboard camera on Jim's car. The Oldsmobile Aurora pace car is in front of the field. The field, of course, now single file because the race is underway. And all of the crews at the pit wall, they lean over the wall and make sure that even if the two-way radios are working, they get plenty of good information. Jim Guthrie is going to come back in using that old signaling method of uh, just a big chalkboard. A little fancier today. Well, it is, uh, he is very fortunate. We've got this yellow for the rain and, and uh, the action on the racetrack, and this could give him an opportunity if it isn't terminal, if it isn't uh, compression in the motor that's forcing the water out, uh, maybe they can do something about this situation. And on the rain, Chips, we've got a slight drizzle, but it's a steady drizzle oh down God. here in turn two. with a USAC decision to have him shut that motor down. But this may work to their advantage. It may give them an opportunity they otherwise would not have had because they will stop all of the cars. Now, in the past, they have waited a specific interval until they've said you can work on the cars. If they let them go to work on that right away, they may have gained a great deal of time. Well, they're getting as many breaks as they can, but, you know, they're already three or four laps down. Um, We'll just have to wait and see what happens. But Gordon is down here, Tommy's down six laps, and that's going to be pretty hard to overcome. We're actually down seven now, Danny. Yes, but what they're going to do is bring, bring the cars helps. in single file here, and then they will be able, once they get everybody back over to the main stretch, they're going to let them go to work on the cars. Now, 
with the rain coming down and the yellow on, here's what Tony Stewart did. <laughs> he says, hey, here, here's a good idea. Anybody have a red flag? I think they noticed it in the pace car since they had the windshield wipers on. Of course, you don't want to risk these machines even at the slower speed, so they're uh, about 80 miles an hour for the pace car when the uh, yellow flag goes out. That's, that's still fast. The tires are slick, and running those cars at speed is not a safe thing, so the United States Auto Club has made this decision. And when you, you look know, down at the track surface, Tom, it doesn't look all that wet, but it's really hard to tell. Well, it's not that damp, and let's hope it doesn't get much worse, but it, it's too damp to run these uh, little rocket ships at 200 miles an hour. You know, guys down here, like in turn two, I can look right down at the pavement. It's probably no more than 50% with a little tiny spots or maybe a third wet. The problem is it's a real slow, light drizzle. Now there's turn two as we look down from the Goodyear blimp spirit leading to the back straightaway. Rain has stopped the Indianapolis 500. Robbie Gordon climbs up nice and high in his cockpit. Everybody else stays down low. And the field will roll now to a stop. The what? engines will be switched off and then they will be allowed to work on the machines. When they come back to green, Tony Stewart will lead Ari Leyendijk and Robbie Buell. We'll return with more of the Indianapolis 500 after this message and a word from our ABC station. The 81st running of the Indianapolis 500 continues on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Well, if you've been following the Indy 500 on your computer, you know that right now the race has stopped with 15 laps to go, and car two, that's Tony Stewart, is the leader of the race. If you haven't yet done that, drag the computer up close to the television set on America Online, type in the keywords ABC Sports, and you can see the timing and scoring as it reels off. Don't forget, too, to join ABC Sports on June 7th for the 129th running of the Belmont Stakes. Silver Charm attempts to become the first Triple Crown winner since 1978. And on the Wide World Classic, Julie Crone rides Colonial Affair to become the first female jockey to win a Triple Crown race. Now let's go to Jackaroo. Well, Paul, believe it or not, Jim Guthrie feels that the car is ready to go back out, so this red flag is a break for you. Well, we were ready to go back out, but uh, of course the red flag because of the rain. Uh, we're down, we're not out. We had an overheating problem. And you say it came from the turbulence. You've never experienced turbulence like this. Oh yeah, it's the same as before. It's just that uh, we had a block off plate from the radiator. And uh, it was too big, so the car overheated. So the oil pressure went down, oil temperature came up, water temperature came up. So we just managed to pull it in, put some water in it, go back out, cool it off. And of course it's the red flag, but we'll be ready to go. Uh, I got a question for you. Has anybody ever won this from seven laps down? We're about to find out for the rest of this, but I, I got to ask you a serious uh -huh. one. You know, you're such a mild-mannered and good-natured guy. The intensity of the moment, the disappointment when you pulled on the pit road, we rode aboard with you and saw that, I mean, it was like you were just unglued in the race car in disappointment. Talk about adrenaline, huh? Yeah. That was it. Paul, it's amazing what it'll do to people. You know, Jim Guthrie, he has a chance. The crews have been released to work on their machines. That does not include any car that has been taken behind the pit wall back to the garage area. Jerry Punch. Well, we're standing with Robbie Gordon, Paul, and Robbie from 12th to 4th in a hurry. You didn't waste much time. Uh, we, we had a couple guys. We were a little worried about their engines. I mean, I know everybody's worried about ours, too, but, um, you know, we, we wanted to get up and run with the front guys, and, and we got the speed to do it. Once we got up to them, we found out that we did have the speed because it's the first time I've run this engine. Um, we just put it in sixth gear. We were cruising. We saw you get out of the car, and when talking to Robbie Buell, there was a misunderstanding. Of, it was just a miscommunication a little bit. I saw you and Larry Kerr having a few words. I think I think Larry thought I was yelling at Robbie or something, but um, Robbie obviously didn't see me on the outside of the short shoot. I, I got around the outside of him and won, and um, I had to get on the brakes pretty big. We almost both um, got in a wreck, and I just, you know, let him know it's a long race. I mean, keep your mirrors open, and, you know, he's a good driver. I mean, um, you know, we're, we're both out there trying to do the best job we can. It's, it's too early in the race. Concerns over your motor, the motor you had to wait for until Saturday, running okay thus far? 
running great. I mean, the thing's just running really smooth. Um, it's making the power to run with those guys. We might even be a little short geared. Um, you know, we, we got on the Revlon a couple times in sixth gear. I think we were running 229 on the straight. That's Robbie Gordon currently running fourth. Well, Jerry, let's take a look at our current leader, Tony Stewart. He still sits in the cockpit of his car, and you would think maybe it's still advertisement. This is a canvas cover, and they do that to keep the moisture out of the electronics. But, Tony Stewart, you continue to rest under the umbrella. What about the first few laps and the track conditions? What's your assessment? Yeah, the track's fine. I mean, it's, uh, it's real similar to the way we've tested here, and, and the rain didn't affect the track, and he didn't really even wash any of the rubber off. So, uh, you know, the track's in good shape right now than just being too damp. Now, when you've got a situation like this and you've got to just dial it back out, how difficult is it for you? But you've done it for so many years. Well, you know, this, is, this isn't really a problem. This probably worked into our favor a little bit. Uh, we're going to get to make some changes that I really uh, wanted to make. Like what? Well, this car was a little too good too early. Uh, the front end's a little too positive, so uh, we'll tighten the car up a little bit and it'll make it a little easier to drive. Now, the question I have, if I can get our cameraman to look at the steering wheel here, there's a big number five taped to the steering wheel. Tell us what that means. That's just my, that's my gauge in case uh, we lose radio communication. I know when the, when the fuel number gets to five, then I get to five gallons, that's time for me to come in. So it's kind of like, Paul, when the big hand goes on the little hand, it's time to pit. Counting backwards to the 35 gallon fuel load on the tank in these cars. Down five gallons from last year, Gary Gerald. Let's go back now to that opening situation. Buzz Calkins was in row six. You had a pretty good look at what went on that wiped out row five coming to the green. What do you see? Well, I kind of saw when we were, when we were going into two, or turn four there that, that uh, Greg Warren and Giappone guy kind of started squeezing each other. I don't know if it was either one of their faults, but uh, and really they just kind of squeezed together, touched tires, and then I think Brack was kind of the unfortunate recipient of the whole thing. Any problem for you trying to avoid that incident? No, I mean, I was, I was on the inside, so I got I got right by it when I saw that they were gonna, when they were gonna go up towards the wall. So yeah, it wasn't a problem for us, but it's, it's unfortunate for those guys. What's the plan for you and your team right now during this red flag? Well, actually, this came at a pretty opportune time for us just because uh, we were getting to the point where the car, where the fuel load was coming off of it and uh, it was getting a little loose. It started out at pretty neutral, and so we're going to make some adjustments to hopefully get it so we can we can run the whole fuel load. You're pretty laid back about this whole situation, but I guess it's been that kind of month at Indianapolis, on and off again. I'm, I'm confident where we are, where, where how everything's happening, and so I, you know, I think we have a good chance of this, and you know, I just hope, hope we get everything going here pretty quick. Thank you. Jack? Well, Gary, Fred Treadway, Tim Waldrop right here, and Ari Leyendijk are having a discussion. What we've seen so far from Ari Leyendijk is a very laid-back, cautious approach. Is that how you're going after it? That's true. Uh, in turn four, uh, my spotter told me that somebody blew an engine as we were coming up for the real start. So I'm the, I'm the first one there, and I saw smoke in the air still, and I figured, you know, I'd have to check out turn four before I go through it hard, and that's when Tony passed me, but... After that, we were pretty much, you know, in real good shape, just following Tony around, and uh, it's a long way to go, you know. So uh, the car's working really well. I'm really happy with things so far. How much rabbit and hound are we going to see today? How much is one guy maybe going to be let to lead, and how much are you going to somebody else going to just lay back and wait to fail? Well, I don't like to wait back too much because the pit stops can go wrong, and you can lose some time there. So. Um, we're just going to stay in contention, and if we can lead, we'll lead, but if uh, we just have to stay in contention, that's good enough for us as well. The wind is starting to kick up, Ari. Is that going to have to demand some changes now that you've got this opportunity under the red flag condition? Well, um, we don't have to change anything. My car is fine, but we have to look at the weather and look at maybe a 101-lap race, and that will change our strategy. So maybe in Ari Leyendijk's mind, it might be the Indy 250 instead of the Indy 500. Remember, for those of you that aren't race fans, a race can be called official after the halfway mark. And here, that's lap 101. All right, Lion Dyke, the pole sitter. But Tony Stewart beat him to the line at the end of the first lap. Now, this is turn three at the Speedway. Those vehicles are the safety teams and the uh, pickup trucks who are trying to get the track dry. But high up on top, of the vista of this grandstand are the spotters. They're all collected right there, and they're actually spotters on both the north and the south end of the track. They are in two-way communications with their driver, and they can tell them what's ahead and what to be concerned with. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, rookie Jeff Ward started seventh, and Jeff, you're currently in seventh. How about your first lap here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway? Uh, things are going very well. Uh, took a conservative start. Robbie Gordon was on the gas. He came around quite a few guys at the beginning when we got boxed in, but uh, 
just got settled in, could have made a few passes if uh, you know you really had to, but uh, we got a long way to go. So the car's working great. And I'm just staying in right now because I'm hoping the drives up quick. Was the beginning what you expected, Jeff? What Eddie Cheever had told you might happen as far as the turbulence on the track? Uh, pretty much. It was pretty much what I experienced when we came here to Carburation Day because I was behind three or four guys. So it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, the car, I guess that's contribute to the you know, first plus team. The car's working great. So hopefully towards the middle of the race we can free it up more and get some more speed to pass. This man made a giant leap from motocross racing to Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and thus far, it's been a good one. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, working on the brakes is the crew for Vincenzo Susperi, who started outside in row one. Says the brake pedal's been a little bit soft, so what they're doing is trying to bleed the brakes and make a couple of changes here that'll make the car a little more effective. I'm curious about your first rolling start at Indianapolis. Did everything go all right from your standpoint in that front row? It was okay. I just... Uh if the first start was green, I, was, I had more possibility to, to lead the lap, but unfortunately it was yellow, so on the second start, Tony Steele was a little bit more awake, and, and actually I, start, I could start on the third. We talk frequently about what the nerves are like for rookies at Indianapolis. What was the delay like from yesterday to today and having to wait for another opportunity? Well, there is a lot of uh, stress coming, and. Uh, it's very difficult. You have to keep your concentration for one more day, and it's a little bit hard, I think, for us, especially for our rookies. But at the moment, the car looks fine. We have only a small problem with the brakes, which we're going to sort out now. And I was running in a comfortable position in fifth. Uh, it's looking very good. Your race strategy, will it be one of those situations where you just try to stay with the leaders and then make a move late in the competition? The race strategy is to lead the last lap. Simply and well-spoken, Vincenzo Suspiri. Jack? Gary, you're looking at the blanket being poured over Scott Goodyear's car. He's number six. He's running in sixth. And, Scott, first thing that your crew did when you came to your pit box was take the side pods off and inspect the radiator areas. Concerns there? Well, there's a lot of debris out there right now, so the key thing is to make sure you don't have anything set wet right back in there that you can't get out. Here, it's a leisurely stop. You've got a lot of time. They can get in there and pull out whatever's in there because all it can do is build up from here. So I think the debris is starting to blow away a little bit now, so that's good. Plus, they have just a good look around everything underneath the pod area because we want to make sure the Nortel car is there at the end. Now, let's talk also about tires here for a moment. You were been talking to some, some tire engineers. Your concerns on a restart. These tires have been up to high temperature. Now they're cooling back down. You're going to have to go back out there and build up the temperatures again. Any concerns there at all? Well, we made some pressure adjustments. I'm not quite clear if we're going to leave these ones on or not. We're going to wait to see what happens here. But um, really, we're just sitting back watching the pressure build on the dash as we're going around and just being very cautious about it. Probably was a little too cautious on the start. But, uh, you know, after seeing what happened in four there, you might as well just build the pressure up in the tires and the tire, tire temps. And uh, we'll sit back and just hang around all day. How tough has this month of May been for you? We documented the illness, but it's got to be tearing you apart a little bit, too, because it was a time for celebration. You and your wife, Leslie, celebrating the birth of your daughter, and, and yet you've got to be out here answering questions to us, driving at 200 miles an hour. Is there any time for family? Well, it's been tough this month. It's probably May. It's probably not the month to have a child. You know, Christopher and Michael were born in January and February, respectively, but uh, Haley was born this month. She's a beautiful baby girl. We're very happy. We're very blessed, and... Uh, Right now, the whole thing is that when you get back in the car and you put your helmet on, the whole thing is everybody on the Nortel team is just thinking, make sure we're out there all day long. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm anxious. It's been an up and down couple of days because we were in the garage, we were ready to go, and then uh, we came out here just about ready to get in the car, and your motion builds up, and then all of a sudden, you know, the rain comes and you're back inside. So this morning, you're up, you're just getting in a rhythm, and then all of a sudden, the sprinkles start to come. So, you know, it's playing with uh, the team because of setups information and uh, what to do, and it's playing with the drivers a little bit, too. How about emotionally for you? You know, you have got to be referred to for so many years now is the loser of the closest Indy 500 in history. You know, you're referred to as the guy that passed the pace car in the Indy 500. Think this place owes you something? Well, I don't think it ever owes you something. I think that uh, 92 was a great moment in the sport. I mean, it's been a celebration that changed my life, changed the team's life at that time. Uh, 95, I don't think it was correct. I know two wrongs don't make a right with my passing and the pass pace car not going fast enough, but... Um, you know, I just think it should have probably had another restart, but all said, it's history, and uh, we're back here right now, and, uh, you know, we want to win this event, and uh, I think we've got more experience now. It's my sixth run, and, uh, you know, I feel very confident today. We're just sort of playing a little couple things with the car and sit back and watch everybody up front, and, um, you know, the key thing here is just to stay in the lead lap, change the car as you go, and 
I'm very confident with the car. It feels good and um, it's not doing anything strange. The motor's running strong. We're using just 9,900 RPM, 10,000 RPM, and we're just conserving. Jerry, they say that when things are tumultuous and up and down, the guy that keeps the calmest head generally comes out on top. Let's well, go to Jerry Punch. Well, Jack, one driver who sits calmly right now and has had some turmoil early in this race is Eddie Cheever, who started 11th and now sits back in 27th spot. Eddie, we are told you've had a gearbox problem early on. Have you deciphered what the problem is and can you get it fixed? Uh, it was jumping out of fifth gear going into the corners, and I think we have fixed it. It's, uh, we're, we're lucky we had a red. Um, I started going back so fast, I might as well turn around and point it the other direction at the beginning of the race, but we're going to be fine. We have, I'm looking at the board, we got a whole bunch of laps left, so I do have my work cut out for us, but uh, it's a long race. I just wish this weather would go away so we could make up our mind and get going. All right, eight-time Indy 500 starter, Eddie Cheever, frustrated at having to sit here, but he did get a break, Paul, by having the red flag. Well, let's take a look at how they line up after 15 laps. There's been some great movement here. Robbie Gordon from 12th up to 4th place. Mark Dismore has a good run as well. 25th, you can see he is now in 14th. Steve Kinzer from 20th comes all the way forward up in the field. Greg Ray, 30th to 17th, 13 positions forward. Billy Rowe, 24th to 13th. Billy Boat, 22nd to 16th, and Johnny Enzer from 35th up to 25th. So that's the running order after 15 laps and the movement in the field, along with, of course, the cars out. Now the Goodyear Blimp Spirit is just drifting lazily over the number one turn of the speedway. The captain is Patrick Henry of Parsons, West Virginia. It runs about 35 miles an hour over the top of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The race has stopped at lap 15 with a red flag. Tony Stewart sits outside of his car as do most of the others. The 81st running of the Indianapolis 500 on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Brought to you by Oldsmobile and your authorized Aurora retailers. Root, put it on and you're ready to play. Root, it's all part of the game. Nortel introduces power networks do you have a power network? And Miller Lite, who reminds you that anything can happen at Miller time. We've been under the red flag for 21 minutes in Indianapolis. The red flag came out when it began raining. All of the cars were brought into the pit area. The crews are now permitted to work on them. That may help this team. Jim Guthrie was having some fairly serious engine problems. Now they're hard at work on that car. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Paul, some of the drivers have sought refuge from the rain back inside, but for a very practical purpose. One of them is Robbie Buell, who's been uh, streamlining and working on his helmet. We talk frequently about tear-offs and their importance. Tell us what you've been doing here as you get ready to resume this race. Well, uh, you know, tear-offs are important. I've run three tear-offs. I mean, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to see out there. You want to see clearly. And when the rain hits, what it does is it gets in between those tear-offs and the water beads up in between there and kind of squishes it together and blurs your version so your vision so what I did is I came in here and just put a whole new set of tear-offs on and what's important is just that you get tape on each tear-off so they don't kind of flop around now you have one over here that has come off and you I don't know how well we can see this through the camera lens but you can see how pitted and rough and distorted that is you magnify that with two or three of those on there, and you've got a problem at 200 plus miles per hour. Yeah, you do, and that was uh, that's from the start of the race. That was only from I don't know how many green laps we just ran, but um, that's what it looks like. And and then when the rain hits, then it really gets bad with the with the water getting between these. So you've taken care of this part of business. Everything else good with your race car? I think so. Everything's good right now. We're just uh, you know still a long way to go. We hope. I mean, we want to run 500 miles here. We don't want to get to the halfway point and have the rain hit. So we'll see what happens. I think that's a unanimous opinion. Yeah. Jerry? Well, up in the A.J. Foyt pit, Davey Hamilton started the race in eighth position and currently sits in eighth, but the concern that Davey has is the track has changed drastically since the very first week when it was so warmer. He said, I'm just hanging on. The pace is so slow here, but I'm still, he said, the way he put it, sliding sideways in the turn, hanging on to the car. Fortunately, this red flag will allow them to make some adjustments. We were getting ready to talk to Davey a moment ago, and A.J. Foyt came by to grab Davey and take him down to have a little discussion about the race car. So we were now able to get a comment from Davey Hamilton. Let's check in with Jack Aroo. Well, you can see Buddy Lazier is talking to one of the USAC officials right now, and part of what he's trying to find out is an estimate of when we might be going back to starting the engine. There's a reason for that. Buddy Lazier is still complaining of some serious back problems. 
back is beginning to ache, and he wanted to go try and find a place to sit down because, buddy, this is not what you need physically either. Up and out and back and in and out of the car. It helps when you're in the car with that great seat, but standing around here is not good for your back. Well, you know, that's right. I'm sure glad that it rained, though, because uh, we're able to make some adjustments, and it's a very long race. I think all the guys are really hoping this thing goes 500 miles because it, uh, you know, that's our strategy yeah. for the 500 mile. But it's, I think it's uh, hopefully it's going to clear and we'll go. You made one of the first tactical decisions on that extended pre-green flag run. Your crew brought you in. Ron and the crew said, "Come in, take on a fuel tank of fuel," and there was no penalty. Well, that's right. They're, uh, you know, they know the rules and uh, they're clever. They're, they're, we're looking for everything we can do to to, uh, to win this thing. Well, he wants to go try and find a place to sit down, and we're going to try and find a place to maybe get out of the weather a little bit. Buddy Lazier, still the defending Indy 500 champion for one additional extra day. Gary? Well, Jack, here's the shot that nobody wants to see. It's of the radar, and the green, of course, indicates moisture in the area, but what we really don't know is how extensive the moisture is. The light green, they tell us, indicates moisture that may not, in fact, even be hitting the ground. But here's Indianapolis, and to the west, you can see that there is moisture in these clouds. It is seemingly moving slightly to the south and to the east, and so we are hopeful, of course, that it'll be intermittent, that they can get the track dried, that we don't get the big downpour that we saw yesterday, and we'll still be able to go racing, hopefully soon. Well, as you can see from the flags up there on the back of the Tower Terrace, the wind is actually coming out of the east right now, so that would be blowing into the rain. Maybe it'll help move that system. Here is the leaderboard. 15 laps are complete. Remember, if you've tuned in to see your favorite ABC daytime shows, they will return tomorrow. It's coverage of the Indy 500 today. Back in Indianapolis, red flag flies. We try to get the track dry, and we go to Jerry Punch. Well, Indianapolis rookie driver Tyce Carlson's nickname is T-Bone. That's because he's never passed one up in his lifetime. Take a look at this young man, a very healthy specimen here, T-Bone. Let me ask you, you wanted to be here a long time. I've got to ask you at the start, were you as nervous as you said you would be? Um, nervous, I don't know about anxious, very. It was, it was kind of different going down the front straightaway and seeing, you know, feeling all the turbulent in there and seeing all the brown smoke. It was, it was a great experience, and right now we're just biding our time trying to pass cars one by one. And, Kind of taking it easy so we can be there for the end of the race. You started 26, now 19th. You passed seven cars. Some of the drivers are saying this track reminds them of a dirt track, the way the cars are slipping and sliding out there. You're actually having to drive the car. Does it remind you a little bit of some of the sprint car days? Well, I don't know how many dirt track drivers there actually are here, but no, we, we have just a tad bit of an understeer right now. That's what we wanted the car to do. And no, the car feels great. Uh, if, it, if it starts looking for the cushion like an outdoor, I'm going to pull in and make a pit stop. <laughs> You said you lost seven or eight pounds in the first 14 laps. How? <laughs> Probably just by adrenaline. Ah, uh, the adrenaline pumping down here for this rookie. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Jerry, remember before the start of the show and in the pre-race, we talked about Billy Rowe and Antonio Ferrari and the manual that Antonio had built for Billy? Well, obviously, you have read it very well and committed it to memory. You've started 24th and you've moved up to 13th. What page was that on? That was page seven of paragraph <laughs> B. <laughs> Hey, yeah, Antonio, he did a good aer aerodynamic setup on it, and the car is just really great so far. And we picked up five positions before the race even started when that row got taken out, and then Sam Smith and his motor started smoking right after that. And then Robbie, he fell down on the back straightaway right in front of me, so I had the spot in front of me next to me open for the start. So uh, Made things a little easier then for you as a rookie. Incredibly easier, because I went down, and um, on the front straightaway, he kept talking about the turbulence and everything, and I just got up against the wall and got a nice clean air all the way down, so I hardly felt any turbulence. Well, Gary, no turbulence, but he's moving on up. Jack, back here in the garage area, an interesting scenario has been unfolding over the past several minutes as the Gallus team swarms over Kenny Breck's race car. They already have another gearbox in place, and the intent was to try to get this car race ready. But within the last few moments, owner Rick Gallus has been thrown a giant curve. I understand you're just finding out that because the car was brought back behind the wall, you will not be allowed to go back on the track. Well, yeah, Gary, I mean, uh, Keith Ward and, and Mike Devon, uh, we, we discussed it with them, and at, at the beginning they said they didn't think that it would be able to be done, but that for us to go ahead and get the car ready uh, in case, and they'd give me a clarification. So far, they haven't given us a clarification, but obviously we're going to go by the rules, and uh, um, we're just going ahead and keep working on this thing in case, you know, they let us go back out. It'd be good for us if we could, because we got sponsors here, and 
we came here to race, but on the other hand, we're certainly going to abide by the rules. Just a big setback, not only in terms of today, but of the upcoming event. You're two weeks away from your first event for the IRL down in Texas. Well, it's, uh, when you come to Indy and, uh, you know, you spend all this time preparing, and, and we had a good car, and we, our team's done a great job with the pit stop competition. It's unfortunate, but we never have been one to complain. We're going to do what they'll let us do, and if we could go back out, that'd be great, and if we can't, then we can't. So uh, I'm proud of my guys. They're not giving up. No, in fact, they are not giving up and continue to work even at this time in what looks like to be a very frustrating scenario where they won't be able to continue to race. Paul? So they work on Kenny Breck's car. The crowd waits. We wait. Only four drivers have ever won back-to-back -back Indy 500s. Buddy Lazier is trying for the second straight triumph and the first since Al Unser won in 70 and 71. Last year, Buddy Lazier became the definition of courage winning Indy. His first efforts at speed did not come behind the steering wheel. Growing up in Vail, as a very young person, you had better ski. If you don't ski, first of all, there's, there's not a tremendous amount to do during the winter, and second of all, you don't really fit in. Despite growing up at his family's lodge, fitting in wasn't easy for Buddy. Probably the main thing in Buddy's life has been his dyslexia. Um, he got it from his father. He would go to school for four hours in the morning, and he have a lot of failure to deal with, okay? He simply couldn't spell. He simply couldn't read. Physical, you know, uh, activities, sports, and specifically skiing and skiing fast uh, through the gates was, was a strength of mine. We would get together at about noon, and he would go up on this mountain. And at six years old, he was unbelievable. He would charge this mountain to try to take a little bit of this tied up emotion that he had and get rid of it. Buddy has tunnel vision when it comes to racing and to, to um, all, most of these sports. In the early 1980s, Buddy was winning championships in motocross, while his dad was now driving the Indianapolis 500. By 1989, Buddy too was at Indy, now helped at every step by his father. He made the race in 1990, but he struggled with a series of middle-level cars. He was recognized as a skillful race driver. The IRL became Buddy's hope. That almost ended against the wall last spring at Phoenix. My mind does drift back to how hard that impact was. I mean, it really, it rocked my world. The other drivers crash, and, and that's a fear that you have in the back of your mind, and Buddy always promised me that would never happen to him. It was a, a very frightening thing, and even today, I, you know, I, I still hurt tremendously from it. I kind of believe that when he was in the hospital, he made the commitment uh, uh, to go to Indianapolis. And he did go, walking painfully with a cane, using a special seat to support the many fractures to his spine. But he refused, as he did with his flexia early on, to let anything stop his dream. He had a plan to win the Indianapolis 500. On lap 38, he took the lead for four laps. Ron Dawes and I, you know, we had a strategy, and we knew that it was, you know, that we needed at some point to start picking it up. Ron, is it time yet, or when do you want me to start running hard? Without a question, we drove the race to win the race, not to lead every lap. I mean, uh, the only thing that mattered to us was to win the race and to be there on the last lap. He drove like a champion at the 80th Indy 500, slicing his way through traffic, caring for the car, moving steadily toward the front. The car was better as it was lightened by using fuel. The pain of the broken back nibbled at the dream, but he pushed it away. Down the home stretch with seven laps to go, he took first away from Davy Jones. And minutes later, it was all his. A lifetime of trying rewarded with the flash of the checkered flag. The pain was still in his eyes, but nothing could erase the joy of Buddy Lazier, the new Indy champion. And in his attempt to repeat that feat, Buddy Lazier with 15 laps complete, now is 15 stopped in the pits. There's Buddy and his fiance, Kara. So at Indianapolis, the red flag continues to fly. It has for 35 minutes. We'll return with more of the Indy 500 after this message and a word from our ABC station. The 81st running of the Indianapolis 500 continues on ABC's Wide World of Sports. 
Back at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, 15 laps complete, red flag still out. A number of cars have had engine problems in the early going. That was one of the great concerns, of course, before the start of the 500. Sam Schmidt, well, the race hadn't even started, and his engine let go, and that took him out. Claude Bourbonnet, teammate to Schmidt, engine let go on the racetrack coming off of turn four. Then Robbie Groff stopped on the back stretch with his problems. Thank you. And his day was over. Alessandro Zampedri, engine let go, he rolled in. Now the one engine with the problem, but we're still wondering whether or not they'll get it fixed is that of Jim Guthrie as it poured uh, water out of the back end. They're all Auroras, but remember, 29 Auroras started this race. Jack Aroot. And Paul, Robbie Gordon was looking at those engine problems because he was concerned about his engine leading into the race. Remember, he was one of the drivers that was allowed to shake down his engine on Saturday, breaking with the Indy 500 tradition. Now your team has come in under this red flag. Kenny Anderson and the crew looked under the bonnet, did a major inspection, the verdict. Very good. It looks really good under the engine. It's perfectly bone dry. Um, the engine's running really strong and, and, and the vibrations are really smooth. Now, what about out there in the early running, Robbie? Does, does that give you an indicator of, of how well the race will go? I mean, do you begin to, to build a book right now as far as how this thing's going to progress? Well, you know, we, um, we ran fourth gear for the start. We put it in fifth gear, and the car was really fast. I mean, we started to reel in the leaders. Um, Kenny got on the radio and said, hey, we're up to fourth. We've already passed, what, eight guys, so let's back it down and um, put it in sixth gear and, and ride 450 miles before we go racing. Now we're talking about gearing. You've got what we call a passing gear, generally the fifth gear, and then the sixth yeah. gear is, is kind of like what we would have in our passenger car, an overdrive where you can conserve fuel and just kind of cruise along. Well, we actually got three top gears. Really? So we can run sixth as a cruise gear, fifth is like so we don't get lapped, and fourth if we get an opportunity to win the race. So that's the rocket gear. That's, that's the get up and go gear. Now, you've logged, since April 15th, over 10,000 miles. Since this time yesterday, you've logged close to 2,000 miles back and forth. You've been in the rain, you've been in race cars, leg cramps, we've documented most of it. What about your physical condition right now? I feel great. I mean, as far as mentally, uh, we were perfectly focused going into this race. You know, all the guys on the course team have been doing a great job. The Winston Cup guys did a hell of a job last night, and my car was so good. Um, we knew the rain was coming there. We had to go. We, we got a little over my head and, and wiped out that car. The car was good enough to keep running, but Felix Savadas, the team owner, decided, hey, we've got a great car at Indianapolis. Let's go down there and let's, let's not wear you out tonight. That's an interesting uh, concept, what you were talking about. You knew the rain was coming last night, and mentally you made a decision not to play it conservatively. Could we see that sort of a situ situation or scenario here today? Well, we were about, I think, 18 laps from halfway, halfway right. so we knew we had to go. Um, our pilots, or Felix's pilot, was in contact with the radar, and they knew the rain was 10 minutes out. About five minutes after I crashed, here come the rain. So, um, you know, if, if they get over halfway, that, that can be, play a role here. You know, uh, we're, we're gonna sit and watch the laps count down, and if we get to lap 100 and we see a possible chance of rain, we'll go for that fourth gear. Jerry Punch, Robbie Gordon's got a quiet confidence right now. Well, Jack Reining, Indy Racing League co-champion Buzz Calkins, finds himself just outside of the top 10 and 11 spot for starting back in 16th position. And Buzz, you were talking about visibility. We showed some of the engine problems early on. That was a problem for the drivers to see. Well, it was the sort of thing is, uh, you know, I usually start out with four tear-offs, and, and I'd already gone through three by the time we got through the first 10 laps. Just couldn't see anything with all the oil coming out. So uh, it was actually kind of a nice to have this stop here and, and, and dial in the car a little better and, and get a new visor on. Let's talk about the weather and the track changes. You guys guessed last night with it being cooler today, the track would go one direction, meaning it would be very tight, but it's just gone the opposite way. Why? Yeah, it, it, that's tough to put a finger on it, and it did, and, and, and luckily we started out with the car that was pretty neutral, but it went over to loose, and uh, you know that's the sort of thing that we'll make some adjustments for here, but yeah, it's, it's tough to put a finger on why it went that direction. Can you afford to tighten the car up now, knowing that we've had some rains come across and their track may be green and you may have a severe push when you go back? That's, that's one of the things I guess you, you, you take a chance on, but I guess you're, you're better off with the push than, than having it too loose. Conservative now, do you still play it fairly conservative even though the weather is threatening and you may have to go uh, halfway or a little bit past, or, or do you still lay back or can you push it early? Uh, I, I still think that the best option right now is to go back there and kind of bide your time as a lot's still gonna happen. We're only 10 laps into this thing. So if you can kind of go and get yourself in a comfortable place and then start picking off cars one by one there, 
um, I think you're going to be in, in a lot better shape. So I think we're going to right now stick for our same strategy and hope that we can get 500 miles in. While Jack Arudi picks off one more, he's in the top 10. And get Jerry Dick Simon, the chief engineer for Marco Greco's car, is looking over a sheet of paper. On it are a series of dots and diagrams for this rear wing area here, the mount. What this team is trying to do is determine with the changing weather conditions where they should position the wing in terms of the angle of attack. It will make or break downforce. That's a major, her major handling situation and an adjustment that this team's considering to do, Paul Page. And uh, remember, the rear wing on these cars is mandated depending on the car. Robbie Groff, by the way, is still running. He is in the order one lap down in 28th place. We'll be back. The 81st running of the Indianapolis 500 on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Brought to you by the all-new Regal GS, official car of the supercharged family. Rogaine, medically proven to regrow hair for men and women. Digital Equipment Corporation, digital whatever it takes. And Coors Light, frost-proof to tap the clean taste of the Rockies. Coming up next weekend, ABC Sports, in conjunction with the PGA Tour, brings you the Memorial, sponsored by Dean Witter. In 1993, Paul Azinger stole the tournament from Payne Stewart with his bunker shot on the last hole. 1994, Tom Lehman lapped the field and established himself as one of the world's premier players. 1995, Greg Norman used the Memorial as a springboard to regain his spot as the world's top-ranked player. 1996, the best player of the 80s, Tom Watson, recorded his first victory in the 90s. This year, one of golf's premier fields will, as usual, be chasing Tiger. ABC's coverage will begin on Saturday at 4 and Sunday at 3. You know, here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, they have a beautiful golf course as well. There it is, part of the course inside the track, the remainder outside. It's the Brickyard Crossing, where they will play the Comfort Classic, the senior PGA Tour event held here. ESPN coverage will be on the 19th and 20th of September, and then our ABC coverage on September 21st. Now, a lot of us are thinking a great deal about this start and, and the problems with it. Let's go back to another aborted start, 1982, the call by Jim McKay. Pace car is off the track, but they must await the green flag before the race is underway. Watch the starter's platform on the left there. It's still not out. They appear to be in pretty good order. That's one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen. Remember, they were going about 130, 140 miles an hour when that started, but there is just no explanation, and now one of the favorites is totally out of the race. And Dale Whittington's car is up against the wall. That's one of the three Whittington brothers. Number 40 you saw there was Mario Andretti. There is the, the number four car of Kevin Cogan that appeared to start it all. Roger Mears is out of the race uh, with a damaged right front. Jim, this is absolutely... Well, amazing. we've seen many, many, many unexpected things, but never a crash even before the green flag fell for the start of the race. We had a terrible crash just after the start back in 1973. That was when Salt Walther spun, started it, rode up the wire caging. Ten or 11 cars were involved. There you saw Kogan trying to explain things. To Andretti, I, poor Andretti spent the entire month here. Mario has getting ready. There's Kevin Kogan. Uh, and now we have a red flag, Sam. That means the race is officially stopped. Remember, it didn't start, but it's officially stopped. It's not just a yellow situation. Let's look at it again. The middle of the front row, just behind him, is John Cock. A little out of order. Yes, but now Kogan just looks absolutely look. funny. He just fears. It's as if he turned the wheel intentionally, Jim. Just unbelievable. And that was Andretti coming right into him. Into the 
inside of his yeah. car from the inside of the second row. And Andretti now backwards. Yeah. Look at the height that that wheel reached back in the back of the pack, where on the right of your screen, that Roger Mears, Dale Whittington, Dale Whittington. yellow car up against the wall. That tire bouncing along. That's Andretti's car stopped with its back to you on the right. Maybe you notice the yellow flag came out instantly. Instantly, yeah. The officials can't be faulted in any way. They've handled this beautifully. There it is. Somebody has a theory Unbelievable. That, and, of course, yeah. he hit A.J. Foyt yeah. really hard, Jim. And it may be Foyt's luck uh, not to have had his car damaged in any way. I've never seen anything happen on a racetrack for which there was nothing. Well, now, you and Jackie have been saying if there ever have been odds-on favorites in this race, it's the two cars of the Penske team. One of those cars is gone, and the race hasn't even started yet. But remember that that uh, finish ended up the second closest in history with Gordon Johncock over Rick Mears. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, I'm with Dr. Jack Miller, the racing dentist from Carmel, Indiana. And Jack, you started in the middle of row six. And did you see what happened on the aborted start in front of you in row five? Yeah, it, it basically looked like three mice going after the same piece of cheese. Um, all of a sudden, I, I look, and it looked like the car on the outside row turned down, and it just got too crowded in there, and they touched wheels. And, and I, after that point, I was just looking out for my own. I, I looked to my, in my mirrors to the left and see if I had a hole to get down on the inside and, and got through it. But it, there was definitely not enough space for those three cars to get through there. Now, you also had a close call on the parade lap. Yeah, we had a gearbox problem on uh, carburation day, and we put some new gears in, and we were trying a little bit different things with the gearbox. And I came through, and I was trying to light up the rear tires to get some heat in them, and the car just snapped sideways. And uh, kind of reminiscent of Roberto Guerrero a few years ago, and I saw the inside retaining wall. I said, oh, geez, please don't hit this thing. And I got the car saved and got back out there going. But it, it was my own mistake. I just, I, you know, was just trying to get some good heat in the rear tires. And with as much horsepower as these cars have, it just snapped sideways. But um, my crew didn't find out about that till later. I, I, I thought I'd keep that my own secret for a while out there. And, um, you know, we're running the Nissan. I got passed by a few Oldsmobiles at the beginning, but I got into a pace out there, and I'm really excited to get back out there. What was the emotion like the first few laps? Uh, this, it's unbelievable. I mean, that, that start to me was the best time I've ever had in a race car. And, and the turbulence and all, it's everything that you would dream. I mean, the methanol burning your eyes. I know it kind of sounds strange, but that's what, I, you know, what, what I was looking forward to going into one. And, you know, I just... We got through it cleanly, and it was, it was a great thrill. Well, Paul, he said he hadn't had that big a thrill since the last patient came in his office and asked for 36 porcelain overlays. <laughs> Jack Miller, who started in the middle of the sixth row and the reference to the outside of the fifth row, well, that was Kenny Breck. We'll continue to wait and watch, see if we'll get restarted. The Indianapolis 500 had a bad start, an accident in the fifth row, and then when they finally got it underway, it ran for 15 laps, and then out came the red flag. That was about an hour ago, stopping the race because of rain. We continue to wait. Let's go to Gary. Under the umbrellas on pit road, Dana, Steve Kinzer, Owen Snyder, doing a great job of trying to keep us dry here under these circumstances. You've got a big smile on your face here, Mr. Kinzer. What's this day, yesterday, been like, your first Indy 500 experience? Well, we got a little hot lap session in there, but, uh, you know, we're just out here trying to, try. you know, it's going to be a learning experience for us. So we, let's hope this weather clears up and we can run 500 miles and, and be around at the end of this thing. Having grown up in the state of Indiana and, and the 500 being so much a part of the heritage and the tradition and being exposed to it, it took you a lot of years from the time you had the incident in 1981 when you first came to the Speedway to actually make this field now. Has it met all of your expectations? Well, it has. Uh, you know, uh, again, we'd like to finish this thing, but I tell you, it's just been a, a terrific uh, three weeks here, and it's all come together pretty late, and it's, it's been awful exciting. Uh, <laughs> a couple times to get out and get ready to start yesterday and finally got to start today. And looks like we're going to get to take off and start again. Uh, you were yet to get in to make a pit stop yet. Uh, we had a little trouble uh, with the, in the pit stop contest. Uh, we put a new clutch in it and I didn't burn it out and killed it. So, But we'll get all, we'll try to get everything straightened out. And, and uh, like I said, like everybody else, uh, just try to be around at the end and see what we got there. That incident that took out row five was two rows in front of you as they came down for the green. What kind of a view of that did you have and did you have any problems? Well, I just seen three cars going to the outside, and uh, we tucked down to the inside. And as long as uh, we got we got on by them before ever, all the debris started coming back down, and I think it was a, I seen a tire coming back down, but we was already already pretty well by there, so uh, everything worked out to our favor then. 
One thing that I know that Dana likes about this is the fact that unlike sprint car racing where he races in the dirt 95% of the time, no mud to deal with. That's, that draws a big smile. You having a good time? I'm having a good time. Despite the rain, Paul. Well, they have now told the different crews that their cars can be taken back to the garage area to keep dry, but they have to top off with fuel first. Roberto Guerrero waits. We'll return with more of the Indianapolis 500 after this message and a word from our ABC station. The 81st running of the Indianapolis 500 continues on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Rain delay continues in Indianapolis. We will continue coverage of the Indy 500 following today's episode of Carol and Marilyn. We'll update the situation throughout the program.